It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker uh, from today. Um, Doc is um, our second speaker to come and join us from the place. Last week we had Carter, and he shared with us uh, about taking our next steps in worship. Today, um, Doc is coming to talk about um, taking steps over the circumstances in our lives. And um, so I met Doc this morning. I didn't realize, I thought it was just a nickname that they gave him. Carter would always talk about Doc, and uh, Doc's uh, like a genius. And then I realized, well, he is a genius because he's a doctor. So like you're, he's really smart. So that makes sense that that's his nickname. So instead of calling him doctor, they just call him doc. So, uh, Dr. Robert Voico, um, he has served as a missionary in France and in Australia. Um, he's also helped, uh, church planting around the world. Um, so I'm excited for him to come and share with us. So doc, if you'll come up, I'll pray over you and, um, let you share with us. Father, once again, we invite the Holy Spirit to be here. God, I invite you to speak through Doc. And Lord, I thank you just for the encouraging words that I heard during first service. And I know that you have things in store to speak into each one of us this morning. Uh, so Lord, whatever we need to hear, I, I pray that you speak that out through Doc, that uh, his words would be your words, that our hearts would be fertile soil, uh, and that you would plant seeds to grow in us. And God, again, if there's any this morning who just need a special word of encouragement, I pray that you speak that through Doc. Uh, Lord, if there's any this morning who, who come into this place and, and they haven't surrendered their lives to Jesus, that you speak that through Doc. Lord, for your glory and the glory of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Troy. I was on a flight once. So flying from one country to another and the stewardess I was sleeping or trying to sleep and the stewardess woke me up and said, are you a doctor? And I said, not a medical doctor, <laughs> doctor in theology. Well, good morning. It's good to be with you folks. Um, and uh, what we want to talk about this morning is what uh, the Bible speaks of how to, how to get us over our circumstances a step forward. Carter, who was here last week, talked to you about uh, a stepping ahead in worship, and this is stepping over our circumstances. And uh, as the slide says, are you discouraged as you look at the world? And would you wonder what's happening? And I've had the joy of traveling different parts of the world. Uh, we were involved in church planning in France for 29 years. It's quite interesting when you compare France to the United States. In France, the evangelicals, a church like this, would be, was about a half a percent of 45 million. Now France is 60 million, and it's 1 percent, so the gospel is moving ahead, but slowly. But a thousand new churches planted in France over the past 30 years. So that's where we ministered. And uh, France has been a graveyard for a lot of missionaries, but we saw God working in a special way by His grace. So as you look at the world and you look at circumstances and you look at your own life, are you discouraged? I know as a pastor, and I've been a pastor for quite a few years, I came to Christ when I was 17 years of age, and I was pastor of a church in South Carolina and then a missionary in three, four different churches and then a pastor and a teacher in Australia. So uh, I've had a lot to do with people and discouragement is a sickness, a problem that so many Christians have. And I've faced it myself. So how do we step over discouragement? How do we move ahead? Well. If we have that discouragement, then you need, you need Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. Genesis has 50 chapters, Exodus has 40 chapters, and Exodus 1 is the hinge between Genesis and Exodus, as we'll see. But what we need is a little bit of a background here. Um, 
Exodus 1 responds to the need to, for you to see that God is faithful in all circumstances. That's why we're talking about stepping over circumstances. Someone said to a person, how are you doing? And they said, pretty good under the circumstances. And his answer is, well, you're not supposed to be under the circumstances. You're supposed to be over the circumstances. Circumstances mean what means circumstances. What's standing, what's working around you, and how are things going? So well, let's look at the uh, context that Exodus 1 is built on. And you want to stay in the context. I, I love what's called biblical theology, seeing the scripture as a whole. And we're going to try to do that with one section, Genesis and Exodus fitting together. So the more you look at the whole of Scripture, you, the more you see God is faithful. But in particular, Exodus 1 shows us that God is faithful in three circumstances. We'll talk about that. So uh, what is Exodus 1 built on? Well, it's built on what God said in Genesis 12, 1, 3, and 15. Okay, God made a promise in Genesis 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Remember, his name was Abram, which means exalted father. By the way, he didn't have any children. <laughs> you know, and, and in Israel, in Palestine, in those days, your name identified you. So they come up to Abraham and said, what's your name? He says, my name is exalted father. Oh, how many boys do you have? Not girls, sorry about that, ladies, but how many boys do you have? And Abraham bows his head and he can't answer. He doesn't have any. So that doesn't fit, does it? God says to this man without children, without boys or children, I'm going to make you a nation. I'm going to make you into a great nation. Now, that's a promise, isn't it? Somebody comes up to you and says, oh, you have two, three, three, one. Guess what? You're going to become a nation. That's partly happened with our family, the Vaco family. We now have 31 in our family. Just had a family reunion in, uh, in August, which was uh, my wife and I's 59th wedding anniversary. So we've made it this far. We'll keep going. And uh, so God takes Abraham out, and he, he says, look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. This is how many children you're going to have. Now, you know, and so he made a double promise. He said, I'll make you into a great nation, and your offspring is going to be like the stars in heaven. Do you know that uh, there are more stars in heaven than there are grains of sand on the earth? Now, you go to a beach. Uh, you come with me to Australia where we served for eight years, and, and you have this huge beach. And you, you couldn't even begin to count the grains of, of sand on that beach. And you take all the beaches in the world, in the, on the earth, and, and that's, that's not even beginning to come, number the stars that are on the earth. What a God we have. Boy, let's, let's take a moment to praise. I, I worked in Nigeria and uh, had a great time in Nigeria. But I learned, don't say praise the Lord, because if you say praise the Lord, everybody jumps up and says, praise the Lord. <laughs> It's kind of, it really helps if people are falling asleep. Uh, so the scripture says, God is going to make Abraham into a great nation. He's going to multiply his people. What a promise. That's Exodus 1. And the, the big theme of Exodus 1 is simply this. God is faithful to you. He's faithful, period, in all circumstances. But he's faithful to you in spite of circumstances. And we all have circumstances. We all have things happening around us. Some are good, some are bad. And in this chapter one, we see three circumstances. That helps you follow me. You know, I teach preaching. Sorry to say that, but I teach preaching and uh, worked with the uh, pastors and particularly young guys in Australia teaching them preaching um, and uh, I would say to them be careful that people know where you are be careful they know where you're coming from be careful they know where you are and be careful they know where you're going you may lose them so I don't want to lose you so we're going to walk through this chapter and see three circumstances got me 
And we're going to do what we call expository preaching. Expository preaching is not just, well, here's a verse and here's what I think, but rather let's walk through the text. I had a great Bible teacher of Old Testament and he used to say to me, when you speak, keep your finger on the text. Talk what, say what it says. And there's power when you do that. Because it's not what I think, it's what God says. And you're just giving God's thoughts out to people. So in this chapter, we have three major circumstances. Let's, let's look at the first circumstance in verses 1 to 7. Here they are here, and it says in Exodus 1, These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. Reuben, remember those 12 sons of Jacob being born, 12 sons of Israel? Reuben means, look, a son. I mean, every one of these names has a meaning. I won't go into them. Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. So we see God is fulfilling his promise. I mean, they're, really, they're 70 now. Boy, that's twice what our family is. And, uh, but something happens. Something happens to these, this context. Some circumstance comes in. And it says, then Joseph died. Oh, what, what's happening here? And all his brothers and all that generation. But, I love buts in the Bible, yeah. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. See, God is fulfilling, fulfilling his promise. He said, I'm going to multiply you. You're going to be like the stars of heaven. You're going to be a great nation. It's happening. It's happening in spite of what? Well, let's talk about that. Well, here is the circumstance here. The descendants are multiplying, but Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died. That's change, isn't it? And all his brothers, they died. And all that generation. Now what's going to happen to God's promise? What's going to happen? Is God still going to be faithful with all this happening? I mean, this is what we call adversative. This is not good. It looks like it, anyway. And that happens in our lives, doesn't it? We look at circumstance and try to figure it out. You know what this is? This is what we call change. Now, some people are convinced that change is bad. There was this lady in, in a church, wouldn't be your church, I'm sure. She was alarmed when she found out the pastor was going to leave. He decided he would move on to another church or some other ministry. And so uh, this lady was very alarmed. And she was saying to people, oh, we're going to get a new pastor. He'll never be as good as, as, as the pastor we have right now. And the pastor heard that, and he thought, well, that's not, not it's very nice of her to say that. It's very, you know, flattering. But uh, that's not necessarily true. And so he decided to go see her. And he sat down with her and had a cup of coffee. And, and uh, he said, I hear you've been saying the next pastor will never be as good as I am. Well, that's not, how do you know that's true? And she said, no, the next pastor will never be as good as you are. And so he said, well, how can you be so sure? And she said... In the past 20 years, we've had four pastors, and each one gets worse. <laughs> you see, she was positive that change was going to be bad. And you know, when things change, we, we tend to move negatively, don't we? We, we want everything to be the same. So, well, not in my house. Yeah, I'll come into your house and sit in your chair and you see what happens. You change something. People don't like change. They're allergic to change. And then there is the lady who was alarmed because they were singing new songs in the church. And she was very upset. And she wrote a letter and she said, I, I'm very upset that this music, I don't like this music we're singing now. I don't like the melody. I don't like the way we're singing it. And you know what it was? It was, what a friend we have in Jesus. You see, we say, well, th things aren't the same. Listen, 
in the third century with Augustine, the question was not what you sing in church, but whether you sing in church or not. Yeah, you read Augustine's Confessions in the third century, and the question is, should you sing in church or not? We cut past that. But what do you sing and how do you sing? It's fascinating to study. And, and we just have a hard time with change, don't we? But you know, change is a good thing because it anchors us in God. So I love this verse. That's why I love this hymn that we don't probably sing anymore. Change and decay all around I see. O thou that changest not, abide with me. And then the, the scripture says, the Lord Yahweh does not change. I, the Lord, I don't change. So whatever is changing, he doesn't. But that's good. James says the same thing. That, that with him there's no shadow of turning. The more I turn on this platform, my shadow goes different places. God doesn't do that. He's always the same. Always the same. And what an encouragement that is to us. So this is the way we ought to read that text. So Joseph died, then Joseph died, and his brothers, and all that generation. But, now that's a fascinating word in Hebrew. I love to read the Bible in Hebrew. When I get some free time, I like to read the Bible in Hebrew. Go through it. It's so full. And there's this adversative word that's called vav, a vav. Somebody asks you, what did you learn last Sunday? He said, I learned about a Hebrew adversative named vav. No, don't worry about it. But that says, whatever has come before is now negated. Right? That's the word, but does the same. But the vav is just powerful. So it says, yeah, Joseph died and his brothers, and that but the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so the land was filled with them. You see, God is doing what? He's fulfilling his promise. He said he was going to do it. He's doing it in spite of change. You know, the bumps are what you climb on. Do you know that? Change is not always wrong. Now, let's look at that even more. Let's look at that part of that expression. It says the people of Israel were fruitful. I've underlined it. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so the land was filled with them. You ever heard that before? You ever heard that before? Where? Anybody know? Do you have question and answer time in this church? <laughs> They multiplied, they were fruitful, the land was filled with them. That comes from, it's what we call analogy of scripture because the person who wrote Exodus was the same person who wrote Genesis. In Genesis 1, God says to his people, people on earth, now be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Well, that's fascinating, isn't it? Genesis 1 and Exodus 1, Exodus 1 is repeating the thought pattern there in Exodus 1. And why is that important? It's because the God of Exodus 1 is the God of Genesis 1. Now, who's the God of Genesis 1? He's the God who made the earth and the world and created the whole universe. And the God of Genesis 1 is now the God of, is seen to be the God of Exodus 1, and he's going to do the same thing. He's going to miraculously not create the universe, but multiply his people. Wow. This, that does something to you. Does it to me? You think, wow, what a God we have and what scripture, what, how powerful scripture is. Uh, we call that the analogy of scripture. Now, there's another thing. As you look at this, you read it and it says, but the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now listen, if I would have written the Bible, I wouldn't have done that. If you had probably written it, you wouldn't have done that. You said, that's, that's too much. Your English teacher would say, that's bad. You don't keep repeating things. You say something like this, well, uh, you know, Joseph died and his brothers and all gender. Now just say, but the people increase greatly. That's good. But the author doesn't do that. Why? He's trying to show you the hand of God. And here's the hand of God. He uses seven different words and if you want to check the Hebrew, you check it in Hebrew. It's the same way. Seven words for what? Multiplication. They were fruitful. They increased greatly. Actually, the word is swarmed. Now, that goes back to Genesis 1. The animals were swarming. They multiplied. 
They grew exceedingly strongly, so the land was filled with them. What is God saying? He said, I wrote this. And look at the hand of my, my hand on this number seven. There are seven different expressions, seven different signs of multiplication. Because this is my word, and it's perfect. See, the number seven is the number of perfection. Beautiful, isn't it? The hand of God on Genesis, in Exodus 1, 1 to 7 shows that God is faithful in spite of change. You got that? You got it. Now, we don't go home yet. <laughs> we got some more. All right? Let's apply this to your life. What's changing in your life? Boy, things are changing in my life. I mean, um, I just turned 80 a while back, and my wife and I just celebrated our 59th wedding anniversary. We had our whole family here, all 30 minus one. And uh, my wife is having some health problems. Uh, my wife and I worked in France for 29 years planning a church and seeing that church multiply and then went to Australia and I taught in a Bible college and um, things have changed. And then for the past 10 years, 12 years, I've been a consultant going to different parts of the world, Nigeria, Hong Kong, China. Boy, it's fascinating to go to, to, to China, see the church in China. I was telling Dr. Fraser this morning that... Uh, I was visiting this little church in China. It must have been about 40 people, and it was about 95 degrees. It was hot, 95 degrees. And two ladies came on bicycles for one hour. They came on a bicycle in 95-degree heat to be in church, and then they went home another hour. Wow. And then you wonder why the church is growing. Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. So what's changing in your life? What's changing in your circumstances? What's changing in your marriage? You know, one of the things I've learned from being married now for 59 years is that things change. I mean, things are changing in, in our marriage now. And you have to readjust, don't you? You, have to, you get one child, oh, that, you have to readjust. Then you have two and you think, oh, that's only two. No, no, no. Those two start, you know, the next thing you know, the, you're, there's four to five. Uh, our, we got four, four children and... Uh, they're following the Lord, and we're glad for that. But you have to adjust. Why? Because things change. Marriage is not easy as it is. You know that? It isn't. You know why? The person you married is a sinner. And you're a sinner. And they're selfish, and you're selfish. So you've got to readjust. <laughs> you've got to learn what that's all about, right? And you want to change, but you don't want to push the other to change, you know. It's like the couple that were getting married, and someone said, here's what's going to happen. You're going to go down the aisle, stand in front of the altar, and sing a hymn. And that's what you're going to think. I'll alter him. No, you won't. No, you won't. Don't try to change the other. Let God work in their life. And that's all a part of it. How about your job or lack of job. We just got a fellow in the place church who's lost his job. What's he supposed to do? Trust God to be faithful. So Exodus 1, 1 to 7 says God is faithful in spite of change, right? And you say, well, yeah, I can cope with change, but uh, there's more. Now here's a second circumstance, and it's verses 8 to 14. 8 to 14 says, now there arose a new king over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. I don't, we, Pharaoh said, we don't want them to multiply. We want to go against God. A lot of people have tried that one. You know, in China, the communists were going to exterminate Christians. It, it, apparently, when the missionaries left China, most of them, uh, there were about a million believers, give or take, well, the, Ch the, the communists killed one-third of them. And then another third backed away from having their faith be external. They just said, well, we'll just kind of hide. And the communists said, well, the remaining third, we've heard that Christians, if you, if you leave them, they get together and help one another, so let's just scatter them all over China. <laughs> Boy, and that's what happened, and the church has grown. You know, there are more evangelical believers in China than in the United States. I visited China, and it's just unbelievable. They're everywhere, you know? And, well, we'll talk about another country. So 
we're going to stop this multiplication, Pharaoh says. So, therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But look what happened. The more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied. And the more they spread abroad, and the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. I've worked in I don't know how many different countries of the world, and you know where there's persecution, the church grows. You know the country where the church is growing the most? Afghanistan. There are some countries of the world, the church is growing so fast you can't believe it, but not in the United States. You know, we have it so easy. We have it so easy. It's just, someone has said, you know, the problem in other nations of the world is idol worship, I-D-O-L. Trouble in America is idol worship, I-D-L-E. Well, if I feel like it, I'll go to church, you know. I don't want to go to a small group. And where's the discipleship? Where's the commitment that we see in these countries when they go through difficult circumstances? As a matter of fact, I can prove to you, I go through, we have a thing called Operation World where my wife and I pray for the countries of the world. And you look at it and you see, the more money that country has, the less the church grows. I was in Nigeria lecturing to students on church planting. And this one Nigerian student stood up and he said, Pastor, he said, could you help me? I, I wonder what, uh, what, we, what you could do to help us with resources. I know what, what he meant. He meant, could you bring some money here <laughs> and help us? Well, guess what? My answer to him was this. The countries of the world that have the most resources are the ones the church is growing the least. In the UK, evangelicals are growing, United Kingdom, zero. Norway is one of the highest countries in standard of living in the world, zero, almost zero. In the United States, it's 1%. And in other countries, it's so much more. Why? Because the more you have it easy, then you don't grow. The bumps are what you climb on. It says that in Psalms. It talks about the enemies of God, the people who don't love God and don't follow God. They don't know change. And they don't know difficulties. But guess what? So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves, made their lives bitter with hard service and mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field and in all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Now again, if you're writing a Bible, I'm writing a Bible, who wouldn't put all that? We just say, so they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work. That's good enough, isn't it? No. And they made their lives bitter with hard service, mortar, brick, and all kinds of work in the field. They you just said that ruthlessly. Made them work as slaves. Guess what we have there? We have seven, seven examples, or seven different words for difficulty. Let's jump ahead. So in one of seven, what do we got? We got change. In one to, and 8 to 14, this second section of Exodus 1. See how beautiful it is to go through the scriptures? Wow, look at that. Uh, we have difficulties. Uh, they dealt shrewdly with them. We won't go too much into all that. So they ruthlessly made the people work. Guess how many words there are there for ruthless and work? Seven different. Uh, see, in 1 to 7, there were seven different uh, words for multiplication. Here, there's seven words or seven expressions for hardship, difficulties. And God is saying again, hey, you know, when you go through change, my hand is there. Here's the number seven a rep, rep, repeated. When, when there's difficulties, my hand is there. Don't think that I've, I've disappeared, I'm vacant. I'm still there. My wife and I are learning that with some of her disabilities. And uh, we have to live with change. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And that's true around the world. You know, one other place where the church is really growing is in Iran. Isn't that unbelievable? Do you know how many Muslims are coming to Christ? Thousands and thousands, even millions are coming to Christ. And boy, do they pay a price. Martin Luther 
went through some difficult times, the father of the Reformation. And you know, in just one year, October 17th, 19, or 2017, keep my mind straight, 27, it'll be 500 years of Reformation. He's a great man, man of God, but boy, did he go through. He, he brought back the teaching that you're saved by grace, by faith, and that you're justified. God counts you as just by grace, and like he did Abraham. And uh, Martin Luther was a great man of God, but he went through terrible times of discouragement. One time he threw an inkwell at the devil, because he thought the devil was, so he threw the inkwell at the devil. Well, his wife, who was named Katrina, Martin Luther said he had two loves, the book of Galatians and his wife Katrina, who was a nun who got out of the, the nunnery, the convent, smuggled in a, a wine barrel. We're going through some interesting, I love church history. It's just so full, it, and it teaches us all these lessons, you know, and as we look at the world, we see that. But anyway, one day he was really discouraged, Martin Luther, sitting at his desk, and Katrina came in, and she was all dressed in black. And he looked at her and he said, who died? And she said, God did. And Luther smacked on his desk and said, God can't die. And then she said to him, well, why are you acting as if he did? That's a good wife. <laughs> she was not trying to change her husband, she was trying to encourage her husband. And persecution in China. Oh, the church is growing like what? Do you know how many people will be baptized in the name of Jesus today or in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? You know how many are going to be baptized today? 3,000. Every day. You say, that's amazing. It is, but we've got to do more because we're never going to make it with multiplication, but we've got to multiply, and God is working. And then in Nepal, our mission, I'm part of a mission called the Evangelical Alliance Mission. We work in Nepal. Now, Nepal is a Hindu kingdom of about 10 million, I think it is today. It's so just above uh, India, the Himalayas there, uh, Nepal, amazing country. And uh, in 1950, when we learned in 1950, we couldn't find one true believer who was true believer baptized in all of Nepal. And the door was closed. Well, the door opened in 1951, no, 1953, um, a man named Prim Pradhan came to Christ and he was baptized. I don't know who he baptized, someone else baptized him or what happened, but he was baptized and the government said, this is really bad, you're going to prison because it's illegal to become a Christian and it's really bad to be baptized. You know, some of these countries, they say, well, I'm a Christian. They say, okay, that's all right. But if you say, I'm going to be baptized, uh-oh, wow. So he was baptized. They threw him in prison. Big mistake. Big mistake. He led seven or eight prisoners to Christ. And they said, no, you can't have this. This is, this is illegal. So they took him out of prison, put him in another prison. Big mistake. He led more prisoners to Christ. Well, they took him, put him in another prison. He led them, and the church began to grow. And just like Israel, just like the, you know, God says, I'm going to make you like the stars. God's doing that with his church today. I mean, just imagine 3,000 baptisms today in China. We haven't had that many in our church in a long time. <laughs> well, by 1960, there were 25 baptized believers. So that doesn't look like multiplication. That's kind of slow, isn't it? 1960. And in 1985, there were 25,000 baptized believers. Six years later, 50,000. 94, 140,000. In 97, 200,000. I said, what? How come that's, ha what happened there? Well, let me tell you how it goes in Nepal. Here's what happens in Nepal. They, they, when you're baptized, you go down to the river and the pastors are there because now pastors have come into being as God has worked. And they baptize the, uh, the people there. And, and so the, the, the new believers are there. They're ready to be baptized. And the people from their relatives are there, relatives and friends. And uh, other people come and the police are there. Oh, they want to see this. And so the pastors all go down to the river and they baptize the believers and then they immerse them in the water and then they come up and stand on the bank and then the pastor, one of the pastors says, now how many of you are glad you've been baptized? And they all raise their hands. And then he says, now how many of you are happy you're going to prison? And they all raise their hands. 
and they go to prison and lead others to Christ. Now, what, what would happen if we did? Let's say in ECC, every time you're baptized, they put you in prison. That'd be good, wouldn't it? No? <laughs> what would happen if the church was that way? Well, guess what? Now it's uh, 400,000 and getting near a half a million. I know I have a friend who works in Nepal, and churches are just multiplying, just like, just like bees and just amazing, like rabbits. You know, if you have two rabbits, <laughs> this is not sex education, but if you have two rabbits, I teach this when I teach church planning. If you have two rabbits and they're, they're both in good health and they don't die, and they have babies and the babies don't die and they don't get sick, do you know how many rabbits you'll have after three years? 50 million. And you know, that's, what, that's God's way, multiplication. Don't add, multiply. And that's what happened. Okay. Uh, so what difficulties are you facing? Job, financial loss. Help. We just had a fellow in our church lost his job. But t- tell you what, God is faithful in spite of difficulties. And we have to move. So God is faithful in spite of change, one to seven. He's faithful in spite of difficulties. But there's a third circumstance here that really gets bad. And says, uh, if you have a, Pharaoh says, you know, if you see this b- baby born, he said that to the midwives, he said, if a baby's born, it's a son, kill him. Kill him. If it's a daughter, let her live. It's the opposite the way in China now. But uh, this is not longer change, and this is not difficulty. This is all out attack. All out attack. And Pharaoh is a picture of Satan. And you know, Satan wants to destroy. He, he wanted to destroy the people of Israel those days. He wants to destroy the church today, but it doesn't work. Because the more he persecutes, the more the church grows. The more there's person, it's, it's unbelievable. You'd think the opposite, wouldn't you? But it's the way it is. But the midwives feared God and they didn't do what he says. And it says, uh, God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and grew very strong. So in spite of this, let me ask you a question. You remember in verses one to seven, there were seven words of multiplication. And then in eight to 14, there were seven words seven expressions talked about difficulty let me ask you this question how many times you find the word midwives in 15 to 21 seven times I counted them (laughs) you can count them so in spite of this horrible thing an all-out attack against Israel God is at work why people multiplied and grew very strong so God is faithful to his promises by the change in your life and mine in spite of difficulty, in spite of all... You may be going through an all-out attack. You know, an all-out attack, Satan throws everything he has at you. What are you going to do? God will still be faithful. And Jesus says, I will build my church, and he will do it today in spite of change, difficulties, and all-out attack. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever been baptized? I mean, what are you waiting for? If you trusted Christ as your Savior, you know, this is a Christian church. We want to baptize you. Or somebody will baptize you. Because, you know, I, I, you're staying at home and you're saying, here's what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for someone to hear a knock on the door. I hear the knock and the door opens and there's an angel, a shining angel there. And he has a, a sheet, he has a scroll and he opens up and says, God wants you to be baptized. If you're waiting for that, you're going to wait a long time. No, God says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, be baptized. Follow the Lord. If you're really saved, if you're really saved you should be baptized. God says so. So Jesus is building his church in spite of all-out attack. And Pharaoh says to the people, every son that is born, throw him in the river. But the worst thing Pharaoh did was the greatest thing God did because they put Miriam and and his his mother, not Miriam, but his mother, put him in the bulrushes, put him in a basket, and he was saved. By the way, Moses means pulled out. By the way. Did you know that? It means pulled out. Everywhere he goes, what's your name? Pulled out. Pulled out of what? Pulled out of the water. What's your name? Pulled out. Yeah. You see, when God is working, I don't care what Satan throws at you, God can turn it around. It's like the sword of Goliath. The worst thing that Pharaoh did was the greatest thing God did, and the deliverer was delivered so he could deliver. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? I just, I, I look at scripture and I say, this is amazing what God can do. 
And uh, there's more to the story. Because in the New Testament, they did the same to Jesus. You know, this man delivered up by the predetermined plan and knowledge of God, you nailed to the cross. Who nailed Jesus to the cross? Man did. Who did it? God did. Because he's sovereign. He's Lord of all. See, when you really get a vision of the sovereignty of God, it kind of, wow. He's, he's faithful in spite of change and difficulties and all out attack because he's God. He runs everything. Doesn't seem it when you're going through it. What does this mean to you today? The worst thing man did was the greatest thing God. There's only two kinds of people here this morning. Those that have trusted in Christ, and because they trust in Christ, they know God is faithful in spite of change, difficulties, all out attack. But there are others maybe who, doesn't, who don't believe in Christ. It says that. He who believes is not judged, but he who does not believe is judged already. You don't want to be judged. You want to come to Christ. You put your faith in him, and he changes your life. He transforms your life, and you become a new person. Not perfect, but you become a new person by grace. And God is at work. God is at work. Let's pray. And I don't know the circumstance you're going through, the problems you're going through. I do know this, that God is with you because he said he would be. And God is faithful. I know that. He says, and Exodus 1 says he's faithful in your change, in your difficulties, and in, in any attack you may be going through. He's faithful. And he's faithful to judge you if you've never trusted Christ. So we're going to sing, and I'm not. You, this group is going to sing. But... Uh, when we sing, if you want to trust Christ as your Savior, I'd like to invite you to come forward and take a chair here. One of the elders will be with me, and I'll be down there to greet you. If you've never trusted Christ, we'd like to encourage you to come to trust Christ. If you've never been baptized, what a, what a wonderful opportunity to be baptized and uh, prof profess your faith in Christ. And if you're going through change or difficulty or all that, stuff, we'll pray with you. So just as we sing... Uh, we'd love you to come forward and we'll be, we'll be encouraging you and trying to help you. Thanks for taking time out of your day to watch this week's message. I hope that it challenged you to take your next steps towards God. If you saw anything in the message that you need to speak with someone about or you would just like to connect with someone on staff, we'd be glad to talk with you. Please feel free to contact me at the email address or phone number below. Otherwise, thanks for watching.